Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the EBI's Science Communication Seminar Series. I'm here with Dr. Clarissa Bargoff. Dr. Bargoff is a federal relations officer with the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. She received her PhD in material science from UC Berkeley. From there, she went on to work as a science te and technology policy fellow in Washington, DC, and worked within the US Senate before returning to Berkeley Lab for her current role. Hello, Dr. Bargoff, how are you today? Good, I'm doing very well, thanks for having me. Of course, thank you for being here. Could you tell us a little bit about your professional journey, including your current position as a federal relations officer at LBNL? Sure. So I majored in undergrad as a material science and engineering major. And mostly I did this because I wanted to work on energy. I think I Googled at some point, like, what is the major that makes solar panels and material science came up? So I've always been really interested in energy technologies. And so I studied material science in undergrad and then went on and got my PhD in material science and engineering as well. And then I wanted to keep working on energy things. And so I applied for a fellowship in Washington, DC. And I went and I worked in the Senate on energy policy issues. So I was an energy and environment uh, staffer in the office of Senator Ben May Wuhan of New Mexico and worked on his energy environment and um, innovation portfolio. So that includes things like the US Department of Energy, the EPA, um, all sorts of energy, energy related policies from renewable energy tax credits to, you know, rural electricity, home weatherization, and all sorts of things. And now I came back to the laboratory after about a year in DC, and I work as a liaison between the federal laboratory and Congress. Being a you know, US federal laboratory, we're a Department of Energy lab, which means we do a whole lot of energy and other research. And that means also most of our budget comes from Congress. So we have to kind of communicate to them what research we're working on, how well it's going, different directions we think are emerging in the field. And also something I quite enjoy is that we are a resource for Congress, being you know government lab, whenever they have questions about science that they want an authoritative neutral answer on, they can reach out to us and say, hey, you know, I'm hearing a lot about AI, which is the really hot topic this summer and this year. Like, okay, can someone, you know, you have a supercomputer at Berkeley Lab, can you can your scientists tell us a bit more about different applications in AI? You know, what are the risks? What are the opportunities? And so we get to provide feedback on anything from quantum science to AI to grid interconnection with renewable resources on the grid and all sorts of work. Great, thank you so much for that outline. In your line of work, is it common to see people with a background in both law and science or are people usually more involved in one field than the other? So I tend to see people much more involved in one or the other. You know, usually most people who work in, in government, specifically in the legislative branch, will have either a legal or policy, you know, public policy background, sometimes a public health background if they work on health issues. There's not too many uh, like scientists who are working directly in Congress. And on the other side, you know, scientists tend to have been scientists through and through from their education and all their work experiences. You don't see as many people come say from a legal background into a science background, although that happens sometimes. So in the end, the science policy community, which is at the center of this little Venn diagram, is kind of a small, occasionally tight knit community, which is really fun professionally because you kind of get to know a lot of the a lot of the same folks who usually are some, you know, science nerd who decided to go and try to make a difference in government. And so we have a, a nice um, kinship over that. Great, so then with that, what do you think is the importance of having science communication skills in governmental work? I'd say it's a really, really important skill, if not the most important skill, is if you're doing you know, any kind of public service or any kind of work that involves science, is you're going to need to talk to people you know, in the government and in the public who don't have a scientific background. And this is you know, a skill I would advocate for any person who's studying or working in science to develop is the ability to talk to people the ability to know what is jargon and how not to use it, the ability to avoid you know, too many acronyms or um, you know, other kinds of unapproachable language. So science communication is a couple of things. One is talking in a really accessible manner using kind of a normal everyday vocabulary. And two, it's also being sure to still get your point across, right? Still talk about like, what is the cool thing about science? How can it help people? Um, you know, Where is it right now and where is it going? So 
you know, I'd say it's probably the most important skill if you work anywhere near that intersection is learning how to talk about it because you could do the best science in the world, but if you can't communicate it, then it's as if it didn't happen because it means you won't get continued funding for it. You won't get public support for it. And, you know, your science might, might wither away if you can't properly talk about it. So you're kind of hinting at this. What do you think are the main challenges in communicating science as part of a federal agency? Yeah, so as, as a Department of Energy lab, you know, we do so much work that might not even sound like it's energy related work. You know, we do anything from basic physics, like the Big Bang and like what the expansion of the universe right after the Big Bang um, and, you know, investigations into dark matter and really cool stuff like that. But we also do applied energy technologies like, you know, solar cells and how do you have like you know, two way EV charging at your house? How do we make our electric grid more resilient to things like climate change and even cyber attacks and, and work like that? We also have people working on, you know, batteries, but also methods for nanoscale like drug delivery and a lot of really cool, you know, biological works with sustainable farming and just a really broad scope of work. And so a big challenge for us is kind of capturing that scope, getting the public to care about it, seeing how it benefits them in the long run. And, you know, a really good example of this is NASA as a federal agency, because they have kind of captured the imagination of the public. And they're really good at showing that, look, this research that we did for the shuttle is now used in, you know, microwaves in your house or just all sorts of, you know, space blankets are now camping blankets. And there's a lot of technologies that kind of came out of that research process that, you know, changed the way we work. Cell phones, the ability to communicate with the satellite. Um, this is all kind of from space research. And so we do really similar, you know, work to communicate, you know, with NASA and collaborate with them. Um, but we do a lot of work that has far reaching um, impacts and including like, you know, new devices and transistors, which are tiny electrical components that are found in every electronic device. And, you know, there's technology that was developed at Berkeley Lab that is now in you know, every new generation of iPhone, for example. So it's, it's long time, you know, dedication to fundamental and discovery science research that makes its way into the public. And it can be challenging to get this story across to people who, you know, usually don't think about how federal research impacts their day-to-day -day life. Great, that's super insightful, especially the NASA example. I never previously thought about it in that way, so thank you for sharing. So given your time in Congress, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions about working as a scientist within Congress? Yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting. There's about, um, about 60, perhaps, um, PhD scientists who are working in Congress at any one time, maybe up to 100, but given that congressional staff is about 10,000, it's a really small proportion. And what you might think a scientist does well in Congress is, you know, things like research or data analysis and stuff like that. But generally, um, you know, we're not too different from another congressional staffer, but we do use our scientific skills of, you know, knowing what evidence can support the conclusion and when more data is needed. And also, you know, knowing how to read long policy documents because we spend a lot of our time reading long journal articles and review articles. So there's a lot of skills that come over from science background, but we're not there doing what we call primary research, which means like do, conducting your own research. We're doing a lot of like secondary, like reading what other people's research is and kind of shortening and condensing that information, pulling out the key points and the most salient, you know, arguments for a policy or against a policy and kind of making the case to your boss who would be a member of Congress about, you know, what would best benefit their constituents. Because every member of Congress is chiefly concerned about their own state or their own district. And so every single issue that comes before the office has to be put in that context. And so there's not a whole lot of you know, scientific analysis that I was doing, but I was relying on a lot of external experts and think tanks and other people kind of in the policy space who are doing a lot of, a lot of work in order to communicate that and kind of condense down that funnel and get it to the decision makers. So then this talk of getting to the decision makers, have you ever experienced conflicting goals between the scientific community and the governmental realm that you're dealing with? And how do you aim to minimize these conflicts? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of contentious issues, both before Congress and honestly in the scientific community. The difference being that they have different methods of kind of working out those differences. Um, in the scientific community, you know, we have our scientific method, we have a hypothesis, we, we put up 
um, you know, data and suggested conclusions. And then the community has a debate. And usually this debate is open and it is as objective as we can manage. And eventually, you know, a field or a group of like a large body of people will come to, you know, some set of communal consensus. Whereas in Congress, it might be that you kind of have to agree to disagree and say, I fundamentally don't think that policy will work or that I don't want that policy to have that outcome. I want it to have a different outcome entirely. And what we're gonna do to compromise is that we're each gonna get 60% of we want, but they won't get 100% of what they want. And so it, it's a very different approach to try to reach consensus. In Congress, you see this in terms of thousand page or 2000 page bills where everybody gets a little piece of something that they really want, but then they have to kind of deal with a lot of other things that they're less than thrilled about. Um, and it's, it's tricky between, you know, dealing with a scientific issue and a congressional issue, whereas you might say something is objective if you're just speaking about the science, but then the policy choice you make with that information in hand isn't always so straightforward because there's additional inputs. There's what we call, you know, the kind of objective consensus of a big group of scientists, but then you also have economic considerations, like maybe the solution is too expensive and it means that we would need to cut down on some other essential government service. And so there's a trade-off and most of what, you know, Congress has to decide is what trade-offs are worth it. You know, who will support this trade-off or that trade-off? Is this gonna affect jobs in my district? Is it gonna affect, you know, the tax revenue that pays for the roads and schools and emergency services in my district? Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that you might be counterintuitive, but that an individual member of Congress might care deeply about, even uh, if it is, on its surface, a bit of a disagreement with what scientists say. Interesting. What would you say, how would you say the process of communicating science to federal lawmakers differs from communicating science to students, given your experience as a graduate student instructor? Yeah, uh, you know, funny enough, it's not too different in terms of how I talk and what the examples I give. Um, but I do, you know, the major difference would be I'm not trying to instruct members of Congress on how to do a math problem or how to do some kind of analysis. I am pretty much giving them the top line, you know, the, the bottom line up front, here is the conclusion. And if they want more details, then I can give them those. But I start with, you know, the conclusion. With students, I like to take them through a kind of journey and help them get to the conclusion themselves and make sure not to preempt their thinking. So it's kind of the reverse process, um, but in terms of the actual language and kind of the enthusiasm I try to bring, it's quite similar. Interesting. How would, or what would be your biggest piece of advice to those who are interested in, interested in starting a career in science policy or communications? So first of all, I think it's a really cool thing to be interested in science communication and science policy. And I would encourage anyone who's studying you know, engineering or one of the sciences not to shrug off opportunities to learn more about communication. You know, challenge yourself to stand up and you know, record yourself on camera or give a, an oral presentation if you can. Practice your presentations in front of your friends and you know, see how, if they're understanding everything. And you know, honestly, practice in front of your family who maybe don't have any of the background that you have from the school and see if they have questions, if they're following you, pay attention for where, you know, their eyes kind of dart off or they look a little confused because they might not always say it, but you want to be looking for those cues. Um, there's also probably clubs and organizations at your school or at your university that are around communication or science policy and definitely encourage all of you to get involved in that and just give it a try. If you're interested, you'll probably learn a lot and meet some cool people. And if you're not interested, no harm, no foul. Very true. So that just about does it for all of our questions. So thank you so much for your time, Dr. Bargov, and thank you for sharing your story and thoughts on science communication in the government. It's inspiring to see someone with such an extensive and accomplished background aiming to bridge the gaps between science and policy. For myself and everyone at the EBI, we wish you the best in your goals and any future projects you may take on. So thank you. Thanks so much, Logan. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you for checking out the EBI's seminar series on science communications. If you've enjoyed this video, please feel free to like and subscribe to our channel for more content on how science is communicated. Be sure to follow along for future installments or check out our previous series and explore our social media, which are all linked in the description below. Thank you for watching and see you next time.